last speaker of the day believes design is political. He is chief executive officer, partner, and co-founder at Coforma, most recently serving as executive creative director at U.S. Digital Service. He has over 19 years experience as a software engineer, UX designer, and information architect. He co-founded Project 100, a women-led, women-focused organization to help elect 100 pro progressive women candidates to congressional office in the 2018 elections. With his talk titled, A Holistic Human Approach to Service Design, please give the warmest of welcomes to Eduardo Ortiz. Hi, I'm Eduardo Ortiz. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Coforma. I started Coforma because I wanted to help the federal government deliver better services to its constituents, and I knew that I could help them achieve that better as a partner than I could as an employee, leveraging my expertise in digital services as well as government. I was invited to speak here today, but I'm really crashing this conference. Service design at a design systems conference? Well, let me explain. This talk will not teach you how to practice service design. This talk will merely attempt to draw parallels between service design and design systems that illustrate what you, we, us can achieve if we care enough to understand the people who use the systems and services that we create. For the length of this talk, when I speak to design systems, I use design as a verb, as an action, and not speaking to design systems as a technical solution, the way almost everyone at this conference is considering it. So bear with me. I'm thinking of a design system as a holistic way of providing services. Let's start there. What is a service? It is commonly defined as someone's exchange with something to achieve their goal. That simple, except that it is not. I strongly believe and have seen firsthand that if we don't design services from a human-oriented perspective, services will be designed on their own and more than likely, they'll be total shit. It's easy to give yourself a pat on the back about a good-looking thing you made on a device, but really, it could be a mess behind the scenes. And worse, it could fail to help people or possibly even hurt them. Too often, we say, look at us, we did this. And behind the scenes, it's a total nightmare. This happens when we don't consider that things do not exist in a vacuum. At every step of the way, every element interfaces with another element. You can plan for that and take it into account and work with it, or you can ignore it. We often develop journey maps to do just this, to visualize how someone interacts with something that we have created. We try to document what their experience is, and we use this in order to optimize that experience. This approach usually leads to a shiny front with a messy organization that is unable to deliver on the promises of the customer touch points. In the service design space, these customer touch points and their mapping is referred to as front stage. These are the things and people that an organization wants to engage with. In contrast, and on the other side of the coin, is the backstage. This is where the organization, employees, processes, and policies exist. This is the collection of things that lead to an interaction with a customer. To each of these, there's a behind the scenes. There are, these are the intangibles that lead to a person becoming a customer, and the intangibles, or outside items that affect how an organization is able to provide services, such as laws and regulations. When a system works, it is because people cared enough to try to ensure that it works for all users in all scenarios. There are no edge cases. When it doesn't work, you have situations like the fact that some parents have been separated from their children for years now after, the, after being separated at the U.S.-Mexico border under the zero to tolerance policy. Because there was not only poor policy, but also poorly designed services around that policy action. When I say evil, that's what I speak to. You have people who are fleeing for their lives from a country overrun by religious fundamentalists who barely made it out, if they did at all, because of a lack of coordination across the agencies that were in charge of. You see, every single moment that we interact with an organization is a service. 
whether we consider it to be such or not, whether the organization considers it to be such or not. Last year, the North Carolina legislature created the North Carolina's Extra Credit Grants, where they were going to provide $335 to every single eligible family based on funds that they had received from the federal government in order to help those families deal with childcare due to the pandemic, as well as uh, remote learning. Everything was going well, or so they thought, when a group of legal advocates discovered that there were thousands of families in need who had missed out on those grants unfairly. They pursued a legal remedy that would give families who were excluded a chance to receive assistance. Why did they miss out? Because the policy only included families who had filed taxes in 2019 and the financial aid was only distributed through, through direct deposits. Why is that an issue? Well, by law, only families that meet a certain threshold need to file taxes. That meant that the families that had incomes of $10,000 or $20,000, those were the ones that actually didn't get access to the funds. That meant that the people who didn't have enough money to file taxes or those who were under or unbanked could not get access to those grants. And those folks, those are the ones in need. In October of 2020, the Robinson Bradshaw Law Firm, they filed a complaint challenging the exclusion of low-income families from coronavirus relief payments by the state of North Carolina. The firm represents Legal Aid of North Carolina and the Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy and several low-income residents pro bono in the lawsuit. As a result of the litigation, a court entered an order in November of 2020 that reopened the process and extended the application period for eligible North Carolina families to apply for the $335 grant. So how can service design help avoid negative outcomes such as the ones that I've mentioned or at least account for evil ones and make them less so? Great question. First, we need to understand how design systems relate to service design. In a design system, we break things down to the smallest possible detail in order to understand how things are affected from within and without and how they interact with one another. When you visualize a module with a list and a dropdown, you don't just account for like, oh, here's a select. You account for where the list originates, the width of the container itself, how a user interacts with the list across devices and mediums, how the list populates based on other actions that happened in the same application. You document things so that you can account for them and those interactions. In the service design space, we apply the same thinking and approach. We break a service down into individual actions taken to achieve something. We already spoke about front stage and backstage. We seek to understand the needs of the people who do those actions, assess the processes that enable those actions, and document the artifacts that support those actions in order to understand how each discrete thing interacts with everything else. Once we have a clear picture, we can begin to strategize how those interactions can best be designed for. In the case of the North Carolina COVID-19 funds, the Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy and Legal Aid of North Carolina advocated for low-income people who were excluded from the extra credit grant program and applied their expertise to help implement the program statewide through the application form on the 335 for NC website. The extra credit grant application process was open to all North Carolina residents. 335 for NC asked Coforma to build a dual language website for processing that met legal requirements, served applicants' needs, and enabled seamless call center support. We supported this goal by taking care to understand that people needed what people needed to do on this website and ensuring that we could make the process as straightforward as possible, using plain language where possible, and creating a form that was intuitive and easy for people to complete. We also wanted to create both English and Spanish language versions of the website and form 
in order to make the application more accessible to a wider audience. How did we approach this work from a service design mindset? We worked with stakeholders and advocates to understand what the application needed to achieve from a legal, security, and applicant's perspective. As we worked with stakeholders, we noticed key issues with the original application, including item order. The original form asked for the filer's information first, then asked for program eligibility question. This caused frustration because some people would, would find out that they were ineligible partway through filling out the application. We moved the eligibility questions to the start of the form and built it so that if a filer didn't qualify, they didn't have to move on with the rest of the application. Seems pretty straightforward. Data storage was another challenge. We recognized that eligibility information didn't have to be stored. It could just be used to access the form. By paring down on the data that we captured, we promoted more focused and secure data management, but also an easier form to complete. That brings us to legal compliance. There was no legal requirement for a household to provide information for all the children in their household because the grant eligibility was determined by having at least one eligible child. However, the application clearly stated that an applicant needed to provide the information for every single child under the age of 19 living in the household. We asked the Department of Revenue to review their statute and, amend, and amended the form in order to ask for the information of just one child. With less information to put in, the form was easier to fill out. And lastly, we added tools to help improve the site administration interface, including the ability to securely export sensitive data while keeping identity hidden, as well as providing information on the number of applications that were, that were being submitted. We released the first iteration of the simple brand and website in just three days. Over a three-week period, we made continuous improvements, coordinating with stakeholders and their communications team with each iteration. By the end of the period, nearly 25,000 applications were processed in, in just three weeks, totaling more than $8 million that went to families in need. So what is service design? Let's start with developing a common understanding. A service design is the practice of identifying infrastructure, planning processes, organizing people, and implementing solutions around the service. The basic structure for the phases of service design, the way that I like to illustrate it, is research, plan, and apply. During research, we identify and uncover infrastructure, policies, people. During planning, we organize and, catalog, and catalog the research findings, and we identify pain points. During the application phase, we document potential solutions into a roadmap, and we note where there, what the requirements and challenges are. To better understand these, I'm going to use an example from 2019, when decision makers at the Indian Health Service wanted to understand how healthcare technology could better meet the needs of American Indian and Alaska Native people. My team's goals were to contextualize the unique functional needs of the health information technology for the Indian tribal and urban environment, help governments and Congress understand the needs and challenges of the American Indian and Alaska Native patients, and create a rubric that would guide future improvements and modernization innovations to make sure that they would be aligned with that that those users needed. So the research phase is the foundation of any service design project. It helps us develop the knowledge necessary to be trusted partners in solving the identified problem and uncovering some. It is through the research that we evaluate and validate the problem and identify the different stakeholders, business owners, customers, operations personnel, anyone affected by the service. We also learn about existing infrastructure, future planned upgrades, and existing policies or, pol or rules and who they apply to. Research provides us with a common language through which to view the challenges that we are working on. In the case of the Indian Health Service, the team conducted in-person and remote interviews and workshops with almost 150 staff members, patients, subject matter experts, and other key personnel to get a deeper, more comprehensive understanding 
of the Indian Health Service facility staff and patients' needs for health information technology from end to end. The planning phase enables us to bring others along and to learn from one another. During the research phase, we generated a plethora of information. We can now start visualizing that information against a service and overlay the problems identified along the way and those that interact with that problem. Service Blueprint. These visualizations enables others to outside of the team to not only develop their own understanding of the service and its challenges, but they also point to potential misunderstanding in areas that our research may not have uncovered. That is why research is continuous. In the example of the Indian Health Service, we synthesized research and presented findings in an elegant, easy to follow design that presented the insights that the Indian Health Service needed in order to be able to move forward. We did this using plain English and a creative approach to visualizing the findings so that anyone who viewed our findings could understand them, knowing that all kinds of stakeholders would be checking them out. In the apply phase, we are now able to take the grouped findings, the identified requirements to improve them, and the validated research from the previous phase, and we are able to start laying these solutions in a manner in which they can be executed. This means prioritizing the work that we did during the planning phase while accounting for potential impact, cost, and feasibility of the solutions identified. These phases and approaches should serve as a baseline for implementing service design. However, the underlying theme is that it takes a team to achieve the desired goals. And good service design is best achieved when a team starts from a place of empathy. It starts with letting go of our assumptions, listening to people's needs, and treating the diversity of user needs as equally valid. In the Indian Health Service example, we also created service blueprints and journey map hybrids based on typical patient situations. These visualizations were easy for stakeholders to follow and understand. They showed all actors involved in providing healthcare, from providers to administrator, to healthcare outside clinics and hospitals, to technical personnel. Some of our unique findings included understanding cultural medical preferences and practices from conversations with tribal leaders, as well as understanding how transportation, rurality, and childcare issues affected people's ability to access medical care. With a deep understanding of the unique needs of American Indian and Alaska Native people, the Indian Health Service can now leverage findings to secure the best solutions for healthcare facilities as they move forward with their innovation and modernization plan. If you take one thing away from this talk, it should be that there's a larger ecosystem in which the systems that we create live. That those systems that we create are interacted with by real people, real human be beings. And if you don't account for them, you end up discounting them or, being, or considering them edge cases and not creating solutions for them. And when you do, those people, the ones that need the most, continue to slip through the cracks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, and welcome. Thank you, Mina. I appreciate that. I did say your name right, didn't I? Yes, you did. All right, just got to make sure. Okay, cool. Oh, so yeah, that was a really fantastic talk. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, it kind of reminded me of when um, back in uh, 20, 2015, 2016, I worked on a presidential campaign and a lot of the needs um, that they had for the, for organizing were kind of similar to what you're talking about, kind of similar to some of the things you were speaking, speaking of with the clients you've been working with. And I noticed that, you know, as engineers and as people who work in the tech industry, we were all very eager and gung-ho to kind of come in and solve all the problems with tech. And it reminded me of that of the first part of services that you were talking about, which is the, you know, the research. Figure out what people need, right? Um, so it, it, it 
made me kind of smile, like thinking back on it now, like sometimes the solution was not an app. It was to redesign a spreadsheet <laughs> and make it easier for people to scan. So like, yeah, can you just kind of talk about a little bit about how we as like eager people who are kind of steeped in tech, um, how do we kind of navigate working, making sure that we're not over-engineering or over-complicating the, the solutions, the problems that we're trying, you know, to solve these very human-centric problems we're trying to solve? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, uh, I Mina. Uh, and I think that the, the answer is probably a common one. And I said, it all starts with starting to do something, just asking the first question, why, and building, building on it. Uh, too often, we as technologists tend to want to use the shiniest things and the hottest uh, new tool in the market because we want to give it a try or because we're used to it. When, if we ask the question, we may get an answer that may help us understand that actually the solution is something completely different. But that's really, that's really all that, it, that is necessary to do. It's just like ask the first question and start documenting, how can I solve this problem? Uh, instead of the, here's a, a technology solution looking for a problem. I like that, that's a great way to put it. Like, I do feel like sometimes I, I, we do get kind of eager to use the new and shiny and we're trying to apply, we're trying to find a, a problem for the solution we already wanna implement. Yeah, that's a, gr that's a great way to put it. Um, okay, let's see if we have, uh, I've got a couple of questions here from our, our audience members here. So Chad wants to know, do you have any case studies on the service design improvements you were talking about in this talk um, that we could potentially, you know, learn from and share with others? I do. So I shared the last one that I shared, which uh, was focused on uh, studying how to provide better services to uh, American Indians and Alaskan Native uh, folks in the United States uh, <clears throat> through the delivery of a modern electronic health record systems. Uh, that is uh, on our website at coforma.io. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to pull the link and share it, but I think that folks can, can get to it. That was the last uh, example that I, that I shared. There are others on, on the website uh, that also uh, speak to service design and how we look at not just the, the solution on the screen, but also understanding who are the people that are impacted? What are the policies? Who are the, the people working behind the scenes on the on the government or commercial side that may lead to this interaction with uh, with someone? Uh, and yeah. Okay. And also there are tons. If the question was about use cases that in which we have uh, played, that's the answer. But there are tons of uh, examples uh, out there. Uh, I know that the, <clears throat> that the digital services team from the UK has published a ton of work. Uh, there are other teams that have also shared a lot of work uh, in the space. There are many, many organizations that are, that are doing this, this type of work. Okay. Excuse me. Okay, so uh, Sam would like to know how do we or how do you or we research for things that we don't necessarily know yet? Yeah, so generative research is probably one of the toughest <clears throat> uh, areas of research, but one of the most enjoyable, in my opinion, because you don't really have many boundaries. You're trying to actually understand what the problem is uh, and understand even the ecosystem in which you are working before you can get started on, on doing the work. So I think that the, the first thing that you need to do in order to start to learn those things that you don't know is to ask questions. Uh, Oftentimes we hear from clients, uh, stakeholders, business folks, oh, I need this done. And sometimes the easiest solution is to just be like, great, I'm gonna go do that. And a better approach may be to ask, oh, why are we doing this? Who is this impacting? Have we talked to people? Have we talked to those people that are impacted? Uh, in the case of when we are talking about impacting systems, because systems, sometimes also play a part in this, uh, especially when you're talking about like a, uh, a new modern application that may be interacting with a, with a mainframe, we may need to understand what are the constraints of that mainframe? What are the constraints of that system uh, before we create something that is unsustainable? 
because that's also something that we don't want to create. We don't want to create something that will cause further harm. Yeah, definitely. We want to make sure um, that like we are not introducing like unnecessary like friction or barriers or things like that. So yeah, um, it always comes back to you know just talking to people, asking people what they need. It's it's definitely like the big thing I have learned throughout like my career is that just always ask people what they need and ask you ask questions to figure out like to get to the heart to the root of the matter as well one um, of the biggest one of the biggest lies that i've ever heard in the design space is users don't know what they want <laughs> they know what users want what a bunch of garbage yeah like, that is you know that is a little uh, as i think about it, that's it's very it's like humorous in that kind of statement saying like i we know what's better for the we know what's good for you yeah right it's come on yeah, like I mentioned that before, but yeah, that was um, that was the mentality that I had to kind of get over when I was working on like more uh, service oriented things is that, okay, yeah, maybe I think an app might be easier to use, but clearly these people have been doing this job for years and years. They know how to do it. Just figure out what the friction point is and fix that. So yeah. You know, like one of the I love this example. There was a team uh, in the that was working at the at, within the U.S. Digital Service uh, at the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. That uh, their approach to solving a problem was literally to work with uh, legislative affairs to modify one of the policies in order to completely remove one of the barriers for people to get access to a service. And all of a sudden, people that needed to be filing for something every two years, that was no longer a thing. And that was the most impactful way of applying design that I've ever seen. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Just very, very simple things. And we don't always have to like throw the new and shiny at it. Just, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So uh, here's one from Rachel. Rachel wants to know, how do you practically use tools like, you know, journey maps or service blueprints? She's saying that, you know, in her org, uh, they'll put it together and learn some things in the process, but then they might just like sit in a drawer and then be forgotten. So how do you actually practically use these tools? I think that that's fine. Uh, you know, like, I believe that Oftentimes, the tools that are created as part of the research and design cycle are meant to help us address a specific moment in time. And if they don't, are no longer needed or they're just used uh, for reference, that's absolutely fine. Then there are moments in which we want something to be uh, to be a live document where we continuously update it. That is also fine. I think that the bottom line, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are uh, creating in reference to that which we know is true. So if we have created a service blueprint, we want to make sure that that document serves as, as that source of truth for us, instead of something that people are just using as a way to point like, oh, but we did this, so we can do all of these other things. Yeah. And this uh this whole this whole talk reminds me of like the Gina the, the statement that Gina loves to say is that design systems are for people like we and we truly are designing for people as well we have to always remember to keep people at the center of everything that we do and not focus so much attention on you know the processes or the strategies or the the components that make sure that the people we're trying to serve actually benefit from the things that we're making. Um, so I think that is pretty much all the time we have for uh, Q&A for you, uh, Eduardo, but thank you so much. This was a great conversation and it was a great talk. It gave me a lot to think about as well. Um, and thank you so much, we love having you. Thank you so much for having me, Mina. This was an absolute pleasure to share with this audience. Uh, looking forward to the rest of the conference. All right, thank you. See you.